Thing. Welcome everyone to SEO Office Hours. My name is Michael Chudzi. I'm an SEO here at Good Signals. And part of what we do, along with special guests, are these Office Hour sessions, where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. By the way, nobody here is in the hot seat and we might not know all the answers, but multiple heads thinking about a problem should help. We have a load of questions submitted already as you can see, which we will go through. But if there's anybody here live on the call that has any questions, feel free to flag yourself in the chat functionality, which will be monitored. Also, there's usually a bunch of other amazing SEOs on the call. Please feel free to continue sharing your perspectives. I think that's one of the best things about SEO Office Hours, isn't just hearing from the four of us, but everybody else as well. Like every week with me today is Joe Juliana Tambor, also known as SEO Joe Blogs. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Mike. Uh, good morning to our special guests, Luke and Sophie, and everyone joining on this call. Hello, Preeti, Frank, Umama, Uzair, Albert, Simon. We have Jordan here, Neil, Boran, Benjamin, Oliwa, Toby Lobo, Memily, Ikra, Andrew, Idris. And everyone else that's joining us watching the recording at home, write down in the chat where you're joining us today. We have John as well. I think we have a, a couple of people from the UK. I have a few people from India, I think Pakistan and Kenya, and also, of course, Barcelona here. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. So I'm Joe Juliana Turnbull. I run a digital marketing consultancy business called Turn Global. It's remote, but I have an office here in Barcelona. And then I also run a networking event called Search London. And we have the Barcelona edition and we have the online editions. We just had our last Barcelona event, a little dinner on Tuesday. And we had the founder of Search Afrikan, Ebera Jonathan, who's also come on SEO Office Hours. She came all the way from Lagos to come to our Search Barcelona event. So today I'm really pleased to have two special guests. They have been on the show before. We enjoyed having them so much that they are back. We have Luke Gosha and we also have Sophie Brennan. Thank you both for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having us. It's so good to be back. Loads to talk about today. Really excited. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for having me. And yeah, glad to be back. I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Luke. We has a slightly different bio today. He has been just a month into his new role as head of artificial intelligence at Strategic which is an award-winning full-service marketing agency. Prior to that, he was working as a senior SEO consultant at Medeco. And over the last 10 years, he's worked both in-house and agency side. He's also been speaking at events such as most recently Brighton SEO. And he's also guest starred on other podcasts such as the Internet Marketing Podcast. And of course, here too. Thank you very much, Luke, for coming on the show. I will share his details in the chat, his LinkedIn details. Thanks, what a great intro. And also Sophie Brennan, she is at the moment the director of SEO at Rush Order Tees. Apologies. <laughs> she's, she's got more than eight years experience working across the UK, the Australia and the UK, US markets. She's also a very active speaker. She spoke at Brighton SEO, Recommerce this year. She's also spoken at Wheel of Paris. And a few years ago in 2021, she was highly commended at the Drum Awards. And she also won the Rising Star Awards at the UK Agency Awards. She's also been a Women in Tech SEO mentor, a judge, the UK and European Search Awards 2023. So pretty busy, Sophie. How do you do it all? I honestly don't know. But hey, I'm here anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> so Sophie joined us in March. Luke was with us in May and we enjoyed having them so much that we've invited them back. And for everyone that's watching live or under recording, if you would like to come on the show as a special guest, please message us and we will have you on. And also, if you've already been, please ask if you'd like to come back again. So thanks, everyone. Great to see everyone here. Yeah, I'll pass back over to Mike. Great. I think we should just crack on. Let's go straight to it. So the first question is actually just for me and Joe, uh, which was basically, can we open the mic during the session if we have any confusion during SEO office hours? So what, what I would say is, if you flag yourself on the chat functionality, what Joe's done in the past is actually bring people on uh, to clarify things and so on. So we've had Yogi in the past and, and others, if you would like to add anything. So feel free to do that. The reason why I'd say 
don't just turn yourself on is then it becomes a bit of a mess and it might impact the flow of the conversation. So I hope that answers that. But yes, we would love it. If you'd like to add anything, feel free to just flag yourself. Okay, next question. Look at that. One one done already. <laughs> I've been playing about with Search Console. While I can view impressions, traffic and rankings of the web, of my website's keywords, how do I see who else is ranking? It would certainly provide a clearer picture of the market. Who would like to kick off? I can jump have- in with that one. Go for it, Sophie. Yeah, cool. So with Search Console, you can't actually see any of your competitors using that platform itself. You need to use another third party tool. So looking at SEMrush, Ahrefs, Moz, SpyFu is another one. There's so many out there. I use both SEMrush every day for different forms of competitor analysis. Like one I prefer for backlinks, others I prefer for more visualization of the competitive market and the overall landscape. So yeah, it's a shame you can't actually do that directly in Search Console, but if you can get access to one of these third party tools, tools then do it that way some of them do also have free packages too for smaller businesses or freelancers where you can do a couple of um, searches for different domains you are limited to a certain number a day I believe so that's also an option there too great Luke what do you use for tracking competitors yeah exactly the same SEMrush and Ahrefs the only other thing that I would add is there are also great rank tracking tools out there so if you have a subset of terms that you want to monitor, but you can then also monitor them alongside your website and other competitors as well. My favorite one at the moment, Accuranker, it's great for that. So yeah, that's also an alternative option if you wanted to go down the route of rank tracking tools. Great. Yeah. Purely out of habit, I still use advanced web ranking. I know that SE ranking seems something mm-hmm. that seems one that's really popular at the moment. Yeah, picking up for sure. Yeah. yeah. Joe, do you have anything else to add to this one? Yeah, I definitely recommend SC Ranking and the team are great as well. They're always at Brighton SEO, great bunch of people. They're, they're, that's an excellent tool. AWR, yes, I've been using them as well. They're excellent. I uh, started using them back in 2008 or nine, I think. At least that they are still out there and their software is being used a lot. But I would actually ask if you're going to try and track competitors, it depends if you're an agency or you're a client. If you're an agency, you can always just use these tools and then they will actually show you what competitors are ranking for your terms. And you can see that they may be actually different competitors than perhaps what your client has told you. So the tools in these different platforms do operate. They do open up quite a lot, actually. So definitely investigate some of the ones we've just discussed today. Yeah, definitely. I think Simon had a really good point in the chat as well, saying about looking at the SERP itself, just even more from not necessarily like where they're ranking as such, because it's personalized. If you're on their website and things that will obviously get them ranking a little bit higher in terms of what it's showing you in terms of looking at how they're structuring page titles or content or their user experience, looking a bit more in depth at a competitor's website. That's always a nice thing to look at. Great. And a few jokes as well in the chat. Um, (laughs) <laughs> okay next question i run a chocolate kitchen where we make chocolates and host workshops we're getting ready to move to a new location and i want to make sure that we don't miss out on any upcoming holiday bookings like halloween Ooh. and christmas parties plus i need to ensure visitors and deliveries don't get lost and accidentally end up at the wrong kitchen what steps should we take online to prevent this from happening who would like to, Joe? do you want to kick off? Yeah, I think that is congratulations for moving to a new location. I, I think really we'll take a step back and actually plan everything. Maybe plan it even offline about what you want to do because there are going to be some of those it'd be easy to miss. Preeti's already saying, send me some of those chocolates. Yeah, I'm quite excited to come to this <laughs> event, Chocolate Kitchen. If they're moving to a, a new location, I, I think they really need to make sure that their Google business profile is updated and they've claimed that. But in terms of the holiday bookings, just make sure that your form clearly states the new location. I would also send out emails to people that are on your email list about the new location. And you can never overdo social media in these cases. Put it on the social media channels that you're doing. But there are some people that book maybe just via Google Business. So make sure that your Google Business profile is updated and claimed. Great. Anybody else, Sophie? Go for it. 
I was just going to say, as well as your Google business profile, any other NAP listings you may have, so whether that's directories and things like that, I found working with businesses that they had a lot of directory listings that they didn't even know they had, like they were just there. So try and get as many of those updated or all of those updated, because I've also seen with Google business profiles that Google likes to automatically update your business address and stuff like that for fun <laughs> using different information across the web. So definitely try and make sure everything is consistent so you don't fall into any issues like that. Great. Luke, do you have anything to add? The only other thing that I'd add is dependent on if you've got multiple locations or, or your website as well, make sure you've got those location based pages set up on your website um, for all your different locations. Make sure the name, address, contact details are all kind of present and updated as well. Just that if people are coming to the website and they are booking or they're landing from local based queries, then at least they're going to the right sorts of pages as well. Great. Amazing. I like the take a step back approach because I think with something like this, there are so many different places that you have your address. And obviously there are things like your website and it's not just the contact us page. It's usually on the footer as well. And just doing searches like somebody's mentioned in the chat is a good idea, but also things like your email signature. I know this is an SEO. You tend to have your address everywhere on invoices, email signatures, terms and conditions, all of those things. So I like the idea of stepping back and going, where do we have our address and where to change it? We're actually moving office soon, but thankfully I don't actually see many people at the office. So I just trap uh, some really useful thoughts there. Just to clarify what Sophie said. So NAPA stands for name and address phone number. Sometimes you can luckily keep your phone number, but of course your address will change. Albert's talking about Apart from NAP, regularly post updates on B profile. Google loves it, yes. I'd also find uh, posting, especially from your new location, is good as well. And trying to get also reviews of your new location, that would be great. Jordan highly recommends manual looking for any mentions of your old address in Google, just what you touched upon, Mike. Potentially filter through your results show using inverted commas. Oh, that's quite a good one. So you can use inverted commas to narrow down your search results and then update all those directories. Yeah, there's quite a lot really that you can be doing, but also just write a plan and make sure you have a deadline as well. And then once you've moved, just go back and make sure that you actually have amended everything again. Because even though you think you may have done it, so for you, you're saying that maybe sometimes Google changes things. Yeah. Let's keep you on your toes. Yeah, and I think that, I think that's it from now, actually. Great. Super. Okay, let's jump on to the next one. I see there's lots of talk about can you be bribed with chocolate? Totally. <laughs> I can be anyway. There's I want some... to know where this place is. I want to go <laughs> if, if I live nearby or in the town vicinity. Okay, next question. I've been thinking about seasonal content and keywords, stuff like Christmas gifts, Black Friday deals, or January sales. And I'm wondering if anyone here has seen it work. We always run site-wide deals during these times but we've never really supported them with specific content. The challenge, we're, we're a small team and everything we do has to pull its weight. So has anybody seen real results from seasonal content and SEO? And if so, any tips on how to do it well without a massive investment of time and resources? Anybody, I, I guess with, with t-shirts, is, do you have seasonal campaigns and stuff running around different holidays? Sophie, are you okay to kick off on this one? Absolutely. Yeah, we absolutely do. So we actually set up a, not so much January sales, but we have a Black Friday page that we put on, a Cyber Monday page that we put up, stuff around Christmas. We have Valentine's t-shirts because basically you can put any designs on these t-shirts, right? So if it's for like an event around Valentine's Day or anything like a charity event that comes around every year, we have those seasonal pages. We don't see a huge amount of, say, organic traffic coming through them. Some of them rank relatively well, some of them don't, especially around custom Christmas t-shirts. It's quite competitive, which is absolutely fine. But we find that if they're in the nav bar, they're in the, on the homepage, we swap them in and out seasonally, we put them in the footer, and then we tend to actually get quite a few orders coming through those pages so I'd say it's absolutely worthwhile doing depending on what again lovely it depends but depending on what industry you're in if you're in anything e-com like absolutely do it if you're doing these sales definitely put some of these pages up and you can literally just repurpose the same page every year because we just go in we refresh it with what our latest deals are going to be we add our new products in there the content doesn't really change we give it a bit of a spruce up if we need to update our internal linking things like that and it's more just about adding it to the nav adding it to the footer and on the home page and swap 
popping that in and out depending on the calendar. So I've definitely seen results in terms of revenue from it. In terms of, are we ranking for a whole bunch of seasonal based keywords? No, but our page continues to exist over time. We don't take it down completely. We just hide it and it's just not on the nav as such. So it can still rank over time anyway. And just out of interest, the content in between the holiday periods that's left on those pages, what do you have on there? Do you take off the actual products themselves and just have a little bit of content on them? Or do you just leave them as they were? More or less just leave them as they were, just because we don't get a lot of traction during that time because no one's really searching for them and no one can find these pages anyway. And then we just go in and we update it based on our new deals. What we tend to do is we'll do a deal on a particular product and then that deal will just come off the product page anyway. So like the product will stay on the seasonal based page, but it just goes back to its old pricing. What about you, Luke? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I think depending on the industry and sector, um, obviously, if you're going for broad kind of Black Friday, Christmas sale based terms, you may want to narrow that down and and go after something that's a little bit more niche. Um, So try and find your slice of the pie. Like Sophie mentioned, keep these pages live all year round, see removing in links when it's out of season and also support these pages across all channels um, because it may be difficult to rank from an SEO perspective, but these pages add value across other channels as well. Another tactic would be like, there's a lot of roundup posts or PR listicles. Try and get featured in those if you can. It's always nice to have links back to these pages. So if there's ways to try and encourage journalists to include you in those sort of editorial roundups, that's also great as well. And also when it's out of season, that you could update these pages to be more lead gen for users to submit their email address and to be informed of the next sale it's always a good tactic to do that if anyone does come across these pages Mm -hmm. out of season as well amazing do you have anything to add we have some great tips shared already by luke and sophie i just wanted to say what we already have in the chat actually jordan said that he highly recommends creating a seasonal sales landing page where the url remains the same (laughs) but you can update the h1 title or meta ahead of the next seasonal page so again this might be if you don't have very much resources you may want just to have a sales page really for that and that's totally fine if you don't want to do them for halloween or christmas or whatever obviously because it costs a lot more time so i'm saying great point in keeping the pages live all year after the event set up but set it up for next year and obviously update the schema and the other information yeah update and repurpose existing content to make relevant for the season umama says yeah so i'm reinforcing what luke and sophie said thank you everyone yeah i I think amazing tips and i was gonna just add when you're out of the sales period maybe adding some sort of email capture where you can say you can be notified as soon as we drop the next black friday sale or something like that i love the the link building one that's something where there are always all the newspapers lots of relevant magazines often do roundups like luke saying and chances are they'll probably update either that post (laughs) or do something similar so in the past i've reached out to those journalists to find out what they've got planned and simply just doing a google search for last year and the year before will help you find those and you can use tools like hrefs and so on to get a rough idea which ones actually get some traffic and, and and so on Amazing. Yeah. When I've analyzed this stuff in the past, I've I've often found that um, it is those pages that have existed for a long time and have been updated are the ones that tend to win. So if, if your plan is to try and rank for, say, Black Friday terms plus whatever you offer, it may now be for next Black Friday rather than this one by the time you manage to get some traction to it. Yeah. So yeah. just another point, actually, just back to the question, because they say that they always run sideway deals during these times, but never been supported, but never supported them with specific content. So maybe we're actually looking at their Google search consoles um, of, at, at certain periods and see what the queries are that people are searching for and what actually has the highest impressions and, and clicks. Of course, it's just a sample of data, but it could give you an idea really of what people are looking for, because then... Going back to the whole, we don't have a lot of time, you may want to focus on building like one page and then just updating that page rather than doing one for just Black Friday, one for January, one for Christmas and and so on. Yeah, definitely. I think another thing we do as well is rather than just Christmas gifts, we do holiday gifts. So then that can be then relevant for a bunch of different things. Like in America, obviously Thanksgiving, we've got Christmas, Hanukkah, like we've run it for everything. So that's also more of a general capture if we are restricted on budget. 
Amazing. The other thing I noticed with the pages that seem to rank well for seasonal terms plus commercial terms are the ones that has what everybody else has, but also has something different to offer. So you often see it with things like Father's Day gifts or Mother's Day gifts. There's always something a little bit different in terms of like experiences offered or something like that, as well as what everybody else is offering. So when I'm working on something like that, I try and think about what else can we offer as opposed to just the same cards that everybody's offering or the same coffee machines or whatever it is that, that you're working on. So just one other thing, actually, Jordan's made a point. He says, if you don't have a lot of time, you could also consider maximizing your social media. So by posting on your social platforms, and he says that he does that for his type of business. He uses an eye automation tool. Ooh, okay. We can share that with us later. Share the photography one yeah. as well. I was going to say, this is not, this doesn't answer the question at all. But one other tip is that a lot of SEO tools do amazing deals and things on things like Black Friday and January sales. So if you're willing to switch to like annual subscriptions and stuff like that, I would definitely recommend checking out all the tools you use during those kind of holiday seasons, because I find that I save costs a lot on the day. But, but then as the year goes on, I save quite a bit. So just a, a random SEO tip there. Cool. Are we ready for the next one? We are. We are. Yes. I just wanted to say if everyone, anyone watching us has joined us, please make sure that your microphone is on mute just so we don't have any background noise. But you can always keep your video on, of course. OK, super. Sorry, that's me not doing my job. I usually mute as people come in. OK, next question. This is a recruitment agency in procurement. We've outsourced most of our marketing, so blogging, social media, primarily LinkedIn and website development to various freelancers and agencies. Over the past three years, this approach has delivered strong results, such as growing our LinkedIn following from 20,000 to 110,000 followers. However, we're now facing a key challenge. The different teams are not heading in the same direction, and we lack the in-house expertise to guide these efforts effectively. How can we bring everything together under a clear strategy, ensuring everybody is working towards the same goal. Great. Sorry, <laughs> I hope everybody understood that. Joe, I'll put it in the chat. If not, that's done. Um, Luke, it, obviously, you come from, you've worked both in house and agency. I'm imagining you've worked with other partners at some point. How do you make sure you're all on the same page? Have you got any experience in this area? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was in-house, it's crucial to have someone representing the overall marketing strategy in-house and then bringing in these agencies to help facilitate different areas of that overall strategy. So it's pivotal that everyone is on the exact same page. And if you are using multiple agencies, consider having a steering group or a steering meeting once a month where you bring all agencies on a call you can set out expectations, objectives, and discuss around the wider strategy and how we're reaching those longer term goals that all agencies that you are using should be moving towards. Yeah, so I'd encourage those steering meetings. Sometimes using full service agencies, is this is where they add that value because they bring together all of this if resource is limited or if expertise are limited in-house. But yeah, having a single owner of the entire marketing strategy is pivotal in these situations. You need everyone to be pulling in the same direction and delivering on that overall goal for the business. Yeah, all agency calls. I'd highly recommend that if you're not already doing that at the moment. Great. Sophie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think having that central line of communication with everyone is really important because especially if you've got, say, one marketing person in-house that is much more specialist with, with their own skill set in SEO or in PPC, you end up then having freelancers or agencies that may then just silo off and just like, the marketing a representative doesn't really understand this anyway, so we're just going to go do our own thing. It's really important that, that is all 100% aligned. I think the other thing with these meetings as well is, and something that a lot of people forget, is that all of these marketing channels should be learning from each other 
For example, with SEO, we could share strategy with the PPC team that might allow the PPC team to scale back budget in certain areas for them to put budget elsewhere or potentially just reduce budgets overall for the business. We could learn from the PPC team what terms are converting at a higher rate, where like what landing pages are being most successful, where their highest quality scores are, how we could improve a page from an SEO perspective to then help with their quality scores. With email marketing and social media, SEO teams could be creating like great content that they don't even know about so we need to be sharing that so then they can put that out on their channels as well and whether that's a community that they can share that out to there's so many different ways that all of these channels can integrate and it's very easy for these channels to just then be siloed if there isn't anyone having that clear direction so I think as Luke was saying just a, a strategy meeting get everyone on the same call having overarching business goals as well like we all want to achieve more revenue or more brand visibility or whatever that looks like make sure that's outlined with every single agency now every channel may play a different part in that so social media may not be a core revenue driving channel but that's going to be great for brand awareness and then that will feed into everything else as well so I think having that central point of very regular meetings whether that's weekly or fortnightly with everyone and making sure everyone's really accountable and sharing strategies is so vital to making this Amazing. Joe, do you have anything to add? I would say that it's never too late to write a brief. Things people have probably joined you over the years. So write a bit of the history of what happened. Like you mentioned that you've grown in followers, which is great. 20,000 to 110,000. That's, that's a significant amount. And write what your brand guidelines are. Maybe you didn't have that before, what your tone of voice is. So it's a mix between maybe a brief and like a marketing brand guideline and then actually say what you're looking for in the next sort of 12 months and try and break it down to two months and then bring that to the meeting and make sure everyone else the court reads that before. And it was a good point by Jordan saying that if you do have weekly meetings, it might eat into the retainer. So what you could do is send this to them, make sure they, they read and comment, can you Google Doc? And then you can actually discuss that in the meeting and then you probably can have a a monthly meeting because if you can have less meetings that are more productive, then that's very good. That's good. And I also just want to say a few comments here in the chat as well. Simon's talking about write a clear sort of strategy that, you know, or what you were saying, bring in a freelance consultant to write the strategy uh, that could align very well with perhaps if someone has written a brief. Also, Jordan actually said that he works with a client who's working with them and other agency at the same time. And they use Microsoft Teams to share insights. And they have an agency day every six months where we all meet in person and discuss the strategy for the next six months. That's really good. And also, if you are the, the, the person that sent in the, the email, the recruitment consultant, what I'd also do is when you get lots of different freelancers in, sometimes people, especially in this market, they're not sure where they stand, like how long will you have them for? So really make sure that you value and and project that you value the work that they've done and just say that in order to continue, like this is, we need a new plan. We need to be able to be more together. We're seen as collaborative instead of trying them to think, oh, with each other, they're trying to take this piece of work for me, potentially just make it more of a collaborative effort rather than individual siloed. Another point as well, I think you alluded to it there, is is having a centralised tool, um, a project management tool, whether that's Monday, Jira, or any others that are out there where these different agencies and freelancers are either communicating with each other or at least there's a a single view of where all this uh, information and work can be found. So that can also be really helpful in these scenarios. Amazing. Yeah, I really like the point about having that overall strategy and going through it with everybody. And I think ensuring that you include things like your vision and north stars and all of that sort of stuff as well so that everybody's heading in the right directions like sophie was saying it's not just in some cases it's not just about profit it might be that all your content needs to include something else that you're trying to achieve like maybe you're the most ethical or maybe you're the most trusted or something like that and everything you're doing should be ticking that off and and that should be in the brief One thing you could do is maybe lean on one of them who is the most strategic if you just don't have those skills in house and actually get that one to own it. Alternatively, you can also hire project managers as well, just part time to come in and make sure all of your agencies are communicating and feeding back those key things to you. And if you don't have the capacity to meet with these people each week or every couple of weeks, I've done it before where when we've scaled up on projects, I've brought in project managers 
purely to just make sure that what I'm asking for and what the client wants is being sent back to all the freelancers that we're using. Yeah, that could be a way. But I think somebody mentioned about having a strong brief and I think constantly reviewing that and updating it and making sure what you're doing achieves that original brief. And the benefit of having either some one of the agencies or freelancers or a PM to be a part of it means that when something isn't achieving that brief, you can then feed back and you can make sure everybody knows about it, not to humiliate them, but just to learn from it so that in future that you keep producing the great stuff. But it's really hard if you've got a fragmented team that if somebody's doing something great on SEO and it could be reused for social and or, or vice versa, it's really hard to do that if people don't feel comfortable enough to talk to each other and even creating things like Slack channels where they're all a part of it and just talking about their wins of the week and stuff like that can be good. And then monthly reporting on Slack or something where it's shared with everybody could be another way so you can see what people are doing. But yeah, it, the other option is if you don't have it in-house, one thing I would suggest is potentially looking at hiring at least a grad or something like that that could be that point of contact that could train up and potentially as time goes on take some of that work to reduce costs overall yeah yeah definitely I think as well don't be afraid to have different freelancers specializing in different things I think it can be quite overwhelming for people to have to manage all of that as you say Mike having a central person whether that's you're hiring someone or training someone up for that but don't just default to a full service agency every single time because they may say they're a full service agency but they actually really only do one or two channels and kind of add on other channels just because it helps with their books overall I've seen it I've seen that happen regularly so just try and find the best people for your for the channels you want to focus on and then worry about how that kind of all pulls together because regardless they should be doing a good job and you can really monitor that on a per channel basis and then obviously aligning everything is the end goal for there and I just also wanted just a point on this one and it's what you touched on actually Mike you said sharing their wins I think we should also share about the things that are not going well and especially as a freelancer you're a bit afraid to what's this not going well are they going to get rid of me so it's really important to share like things that maybe you would need some help with and maybe you can collaborate with someone to help in an area. And Jordan also mentioned that it's important to have the same overview of the KPIs, potentially sharing a Looker Studio report with breakdown per channel. So again, if you're finding in your report that you've not done very well because you weren't able to, for example, implement the tech SEO or you're doing some outreach and you haven't heard back and you haven't been able to publish those articles, make that clear too. But if you only have a monthly meeting, don't just wait for the monthly meeting. See if you can meet up with the other freelancers first And also just uh, speak to the project manager as well. Give that person a heads up. Absolutely. For what it's worth, I work with a lot of different freelancers where the client has picked different people to do different things. Like we don't do social media and we don't do PPC. So I often work with agencies and freelancers that do those things. And if you're the freelancer or the agency that's working with others, one thing that I try really hard to do is be their champion as well and try and help them and we'll message them privately about things if I notice stuff just so that you build that relationship I know the person asking this question comes from the other side of it but I find that if what Joe was saying before about sometimes freelancers can be worried about is somebody going to take my work and so on I make it very clear to social media people I have absolutely no interest in taking any I will not be posting on their accounts and so on (laughs) But I might suggest some content that you could use and, and often you help them look good. Should we go to the goodness me? We've got uh, loads yes, of... we've got... Okay, would you create an article about a relevant topic, even if the keyword difficulty is 80 plus? Yes, it's <laughs> a short. Um, so keyword difficulty is an interesting metric. I don't really trust it to be honest I look more at like CPCs because you can see that on SEMrush and Ahrefs it gives a bit of a better indication around overall competitiveness keyword difficulty I've seen examples of keywords where it says the keyword difficulty is like and then you've got Amazon Etsy like these big absolute Goliath sites ranking for it so yeah keyword difficulty take it with a pinch of salt would I create an article about a relevant topic even if it was competitive, yes, because everything I'm doing from an SEO perspective isn't just for search engines and isn't just for ranking. It's also about what's actually really useful for my users on my site. So if I think it's something, whether that's a guide to whether it's the service or the product we're selling, or it's like a landing page that we know could help other channels to convert as well, 
look at all of that stuff. Don't just think about, oh, am I actually going to rank for this? Is there opportunity there? You may do over time anyway, but just create content that's good regardless. Don't think about how it's going to rank. Don't think about the search volume. It could be search volume zero. As an example of this, we have started building out what we call Ninja University. And it's basically a hub of our articles on how to use a particular product that we sell. And it's everything from beginners all the way through to advanced. Now, a lot of the topics and a lot of the questions that we're writing content for either have just YouTube videos ranking and nothing else really, or they have no search volume or whatever, but we've built a big Facebook community. So we're able to then share that content in there, push it out to our email marketing. And we've got other huge Goliath websites also selling this product that are ranking for all of these terms. Again, going back to keyword difficulty, 80 plus or whatever that looks like, but it's still being found elsewhere. Short answer, yes, just create the content. It's really good. If it's good for your users, look at that more than just keyword difficulty. Amazing. What about you, Luke? Should be 80 plus keyword difficulty? Yeah, I, I love that. You've got to think about your users. Are you adding value to your users? Does your business or your subject matter that you're talking about, do you have experiences? Do you have insights that can be useful for your users? So I always go with that user first approach and some of these metrics, they're just indicators. They're not things that we should take as gospel. So yeah, think about your users. Think about what value you can add to the subject. Think about what your business insights could bring to an article or a piece of content that will be really valuable to your users. Amazing. What about you, Joe? I think we summed it up quite well, but I want to share yeah. some of the insights from the chat. So Preeti said, if it makes sense for your business and your users, keyword difficulty should not matter. Idris is talking about its usefulness over the keyword difficulty. Focus on whether or not it actually will be useful to your customers. And for that, I was talking about if maybe you can offer a unique perspective or valid information. And Simon then is agreeing with that. You might have the real authority on it. If you're not and the topic is not focused on what your site is about, then obviously don't because, yes, it's quite a competitive topic. Let's give it a nice example. Like fishing lures on Sophie's T-shirt site would not work well. I don't know what if I'll have to Google the fishing lure or Simon, you can tell me what a fishing lure is. And Albert's talking about he could suggest to choose some keywords based on CPC. That might be good to use if you run a paid search campaign and you've seen that there are some impressions, you might be able to use that for your on page copy. Yeah. I find whenever I publish something, I try not to obsess too much over keywords, particularly one. I'll publish something that I think is interesting to the audience. And then once it's up there, I tend to give it a couple of weeks. I'll jump into Google Search Console and see what it's actually ranking for. And often I'll find a ton of amazing search terms I haven't thought of that will make the post better if I then think about, okay, maybe I could add this or change this and so on. So yeah, I try not to obsess over a really specific term. So for for example, on our website, we've got a blog post around organic traffic dropping and it's obviously you've got your Ahrefs, you've got all of your different SEO tools ranking for that. But then for the sort of longer tail terms, that's where we get some traffic, particularly around things like core updates and stuff like that. But when I was initially planning that post, I wouldn't have necessarily set it up to rank for those particular terms that it now ranks for and makes way more sense to rank for. I think once you publish something as time goes on and people link to it and all of that stuff, you also learn. So if it makes sense, I agree. I would just go for it and don't obsess too much over the keywords. We're nearly to the end, Mike, and I haven't announced if anybody would like to come on SEO office hours, they can just fill out the form and you will get back to them. So for those that are uh, watching us live, if you'd like to come on the show, we will be running this until December at least. We've got a few spaces left. So I shared the link to the good signals earlier. I'll share it again here. If you'd like to be a special guest, please email us on that page fill in the form and for those that are watching us not live on the recorded version if you would like to join us live as an audience member as well uh, you can sign up there and then mike will send you the calendar invite thank you so luke not to put you on the spot but i'm thinking you can start on this one because i think you'll know more about this totally just put you on the spot there so together with my clients we're working on implementing ai and other emerging trends into the business and marketing Hence, it would be extremely useful to receive an answer to the following questions related to SEO. 
how can we effectively use AI generated content without risking um, a penalty and lower rankings? And what emerging trends in SEO should we be preparing for in the next one to two years? Um, by the way, I, to I hope that's totally okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll split this. I'll come back to the emerging trends um, in SEO. But in terms of the use of AI, I said this at Brighton and I'll say it again. Let the AI adopt the kind of apprentice role whilst you adopt the role of a mentor. So we can't 100% rely on AI content. We know that there are sites out there that are doing that and that's fine. But use AI as a tool to help you understand what content ideas to create. Or if you are creating content, make sure you've got human intervention. Make sure you're not solely relying on AI. And as we mentioned on the previous uh, question, bring in those unique perspectives and experiences that you have. AI doesn't have human experiences. We have human experiences. So let that come out in the content that you're creating. So that's my thoughts on how to use AI. Obviously, it's there to do those mundane tasks so that we can be more creative or free up our times to think strategy and really accelerate in that area. So yeah, don't obsess over creating AI content and just churning it out because ultimately it's not going to be long term. It's just going to fail eventually. So use it to help you, but don't rely on it 100%. Another point to add is the AI outputs are only as good as the inputs you give it. So it needs a lot of context. So take time to prompt. Prompts could take you up to an hour or longer than that to create and refine. Your first prompt will not work straight away, so you might need to refine to get better outputs. So when you're using AI, don't think of it as a one and done. It's a process and it's a journey, and you want to really make sure you've got good outputs. In terms of emerging trends, what I'm quite interested in is alternate engines. So things like, I'm a big fan of it. Obviously, adoption rate amongst the masses is probably not as high as Google search, but I really like perplexity. I'm intrigued to see what open AI search looks like. I'm intrigued by Apple assistant in the new phones. So yeah, and also the outcomes of the Google DOG, DOJ case, that's really going to be interesting to understand what the future looks like. So those are the things in terms of emerging trends and things to watch out for, in my opinion. Amazing. Joe, do you have anything to add? No, I think we no. summed it up very well. No, perfect. Great. Uh, Sophie, do you have anything to add? I think with the emerging trend side of it, I think just don't stress too much. In all honesty, things are evolving very quickly and are going to keep evolving very quickly. Don't obsess over whether it's search GPT or whether it's perplexity, as you said, Luke, whether it's AI overviews, don't worry too much about those. Obviously, there is going to be an impact, potentially. We're already seeing, for example, loads of organic shopping listings coming in. We're seeing more traffic going towards that rather than our actual main category listings. There's always going to be things that happen, but things are changing so fast. There's no point trying to put in a strategy for the next 12 months. But what's happening now, because AI and all of these new technologies are just evolving so quickly. So the most important thing really is just to be prepared for change um, and be as flexible and adaptable as possible. I think that's the most important thing over the next few years. And I, I would add to that. So don't stress and also don't pretend like it's not happening as well. I, I know quite a few people in, in our world that when I'm talking to them about it, it's just, I'm not using this, I'm pretending it's not there. And then worrying about copywriting positions in the future and all of those things. I think you've just got to watch it, monitor it, play with it. And like Sophie was saying, that doesn't mean you have to push it into your strategy and right from now on, we're going to try and get featured in AI overviews or anything like that. I just mean, just keep reading the news, finding out how it's changing and just thinking about how it can make your life easier and you better at your job. Personally, I think it's so exciting, everything that's changing. For sure. What you said there about things moving quickly um, mm -hmm. and like using tools to help you to be faster with a lot of things. Like I use a lot of AI to automate a lot of processes for us. So whether that's like admin stuff, whether that's even just like crawling through a 12,000 row spreadsheet to dedupe it for me because Excel keeps crashing. Just like stuff like that is awesome to help you. Just don't rely on AI. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. And it's way more than a grammar tool. Just for that <laughs> there as well. <laughs> Quite a few people just from that perspective. We've also had yeah. some comments just in the, the chat as well. Rab 
Albert saying that he always tells his clients to go for human writers instead of just using AI. Writers can definitely, of course, use uh, the AI tools to help out, but of course, it should not be replaced completely. Rob's talking about he used a GPT 4.0 to create blog posts for a website, and then he uses Quill to paraphrase the whole blog content and post it. Oh, that, but that seems to have worked for him. It's been three months on and blog still on page one. So I think in this case, perhaps we don't know the context of where that is or what and in what search engine, but I think that AI is useful for helping us to automate some things as we've talked about, but really we can't have it replacing everything. If we take like a keyword tool, you can put a key, you can have that to bring out all the different keywords, but someone has to manually check some of the things because there's sometimes these keywords come in that are not relevant for the piece of work that you're working on. Thanks everyone for jumping in on this uh, topic. Yeah, great. So I've just had a question submitted, but it's with a website and obviously we're not going to have time to look at it. So we will save that for next week, if that's all right. And I'm going to jump on to a different one. How long have we got? I've got eight minutes. Uh, this eight is minutes. Quite, quite a meaty one. So we'll try and we'll try and go through it. So some background. Our website is custom built and honestly, it's a bit of a nightmare. Complex and made up of a series of templates and modules. I've got this new business idea, but I've been warned that launching a new section of the website, which doesn't fit into the existing templates and structure, isn't as easy unless it's put on the blog. I've decided not to waste time dragging the IT director and his team into it. Instead, they've agreed to let me build this on a subdomain, so I'm free to get on with it. But I'm not a developer, so I'll be outsourcing most of the build. Question If I want somebody to create a quick, MVP website, something that actually works, what's the easiest and fastest option? I've started my research. In the brief, should I specify WordPress, Shopify, Webflow, or another tool? Themes, plugins, applications, there are so many options. Is there a recommended list? I need something presentable and trustworthy that won't take forever or where the budget goes out of control. Sorry, guys, this is a very meaty question for the last five minutes. But <laughs> if you're briefing somebody to create a microsite um, for this new idea, what would you do? Who would like to kick off? I can, I can take it this one. So the first thing that stood out to me from that question is there was a fear of kind of involving the IT director or, or at least they didn't want to drag the IT director into this. I would say do that. It's probably a issue that many people in the wider team are facing. So actually, by sharing this new idea that you have and the struggles that you have with making this come to life with the wider team, with the IT director, will be great because this is not this problem may not be exclusive to you. It may help the business in the future. And actually having more people involved could help get something better in terms of this custom built website, which is quite limited, could get a new project initiated and move forward with some momentum. So I wouldn't be afraid of involving other people. In terms of platforms, I'm a fan of Elementor. It's great. It works with WordPress. You can easily draft something up and, and create something quite quickly. The custom built templates within there are, are, are really useful, very easy to edit. So if you're not a developer and you wanted to have a go at it yourself, Elementor is great at that. See, that's my feedback to that question, really, is just involve other people. This issue is not exclusive to you. Actually, yeah. the solution could push the business forward as well. So don't be afraid of sharing this with the IT directors and wider teams because there's clearly limitations here and this new idea that you have could propel the business as well. So share that idea amongst the masses as well and build some momentum around it internally. Yeah, I completely agree because it's normally the case with custom built sites. Um, they've been custom built mostly for no reason, um, like 99% of the time, just because whoever built it in the first place thought that would be cool and they just wanted to make it their own. 90% of the time, you can probably just have it on WordPress or Shopify and everything's great. First of all, migrate. That's the first thing. Do that. Um, if that's not an option, then and you do have to build it all separately and the conversations internally are not going your way. Um, Wix, Webflow, they're great for kind of just drag and dropping, similar to Elementor, very, very easy to use. I am a big WordPress fan. 
if it's not e-commerce, if it's e-commerce, I am a big Shopify fan. I think if you want something easy to build, there's a lot of drag and drop options. I feel like WordPress, you can get a bit more customizable with it. So whether that's using Elementor, whether you're just using a theme and the devs building it on WordPress, you're going to have a bit more flexibility with it in the long term. And then if e-com, do Shopify, just because again, it's really easy to use. The back end super user friendly. You can build your own custom themes on it. All the inventory, all the tracking is normally pretty good so that tends to be a bit more of an easier e-com solution for most people i'd also say that this subdomain could also be an opportunity to create a prototype in a new platform that could then be the sandbox environment for the whole website in the future actually involving the it director thinking about things like plugins that you're going to need the kind of platform that you want to use is a A decision that shouldn't be taken lightly because, as I said, it could be used as a prototype for the whole website in the future as well. Amazing. Uh, Joe, do you have anything to add? I was actually just going to say that with Luke, he said involve the IT director. Definitely do this because don't just think of it, oh, this is a small project, that's it. I would get other people involved and ask, discuss with them what is the most easiest for them. What do they, what are they able to help with? Don't take this on your own, but just make sure that you have this brief and also get other people to comment in and like just a Google doc and give their opinion. You can ask people in your company as well. But I've gone to loads of questions. We've only got two minutes left now, Mike. I know. I was just going to add, I think, what about the next idea and the idea after that? I think this is, like Luke was saying, a a bit of an opportunity to create something where next time somebody else in the business has an idea, you can ship it because you you do want to be able to try new things and test new products or services. And so this could be the opportunity or the platform or, or you're setting up a process to be able to do that, which is awesome. I think this idea of doing it away from the IT director is great if everything goes right. But what if it goes wrong and you need that person's help? Actually involving them now makes sense. And in terms of the platform that you choose and the plugins and so on, I would go with whatever you or somebody on your team feels comfortable with. You've obviously got a website, it's been built. It would be good if you had somebody that was the champion of whether it's WordPress, Webflow, whatever. To be honest, all of these tools are great and I've used them all. But my suggestion would be to find somebody who can be the champion that if you need to learn something specific, they're happy to go off and play with it. Great. Our very last question. We've got one minute. What are you most excited about in terms of SEO? Sophie, what are you most excited about at the moment? How fast everything's changing because it means I get to learn more, which is awesome because I've been doing this for eight, nine years now and it's never been a year where it's been stagnant. So the more I can learn, the better. So yeah, definitely really excited about all the new technologies, all the new search engine opportunities that are coming out all of these new things. So yeah, very exciting times. Amazing. What about you, Luke? What are you most excited about? Yeah, I echo what Sophie mentioned there, just the opportunity to learn more. Things are changing quickly. So being dynamic, being agile is is super important. These alternate engines as well. I'm really excited to see what they're all about and and how the adoption rate picks up for those. So yeah, those are the kind of things that I'm interested and and excited about at the moment. Amazing. Joe? I'm always excited about events. We had the SEO FOMO event in Amsterdam earlier this week or perhaps last week organized by Leto Solis. I'm really excited about the International Search Summit, as I mentioned last week, taking place in November 14th, organized by the Web Certain team. And I hope some of you will be able to come. I've just shared a code in the chat. Amazing. Um, We'll stop there. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to those who joined us live. Thank you those for watching afterwards on YouTube. Um, Thank you so much to Luke and Sophie. Again, you guys were both amazing. I could sit and listen to you for hours. Um, Joe, thank you so much for co-hosting. And thank you to those who submitted questions. Um, We'll be back next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See ya.